It's a bizarre first night of the Democratic National Convention from John Kasich, oh no, God no, not John Kasich, to Bernie Sanders, to Michelle Obama, and Joe Biden is, as always, an afterthought. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. You have a right to privacy protected at expressvpn.com. Slash ben. Well, you may have noticed that things are pretty crazy out there, a lot of uncertainty out there, and that is one reason that the price of gold has been skyrocketing for quite a while here. Some of us have been telling you for literally years that you might want to diversify at least a little bit into precious metals, and that the people who should be using to do exactly that are the folks over at Birch Gold. That was way back when gold was $1,300 an ounce. And just look right now, gold is at a new all-time high. Well, that's because gold and silver thrive on uncertainty. Massive unemployment, resurgence in COVID-19, an election around the corner, lots of uncertainty. Well, I'm telling you again, if you haven't reached out to Birch Gold to diversify at least part of your IRA or 401k into a precious metals IRA or just purchase physical gold or silver from them, go ahead and do it today. Text Ben to 474747. Get a free information kit on protecting your savings with gold. And I have at least some of my savings in gold, and you should too. Birch Gold, they've got an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews. Talk to them, have them help you safeguard your investments. They're extremely knowledgeable. They want to help you preserve your savings. Ask all your questions. When you feel comfortable, talk to them about investing. Text Ben to 474747. When you open an IRA in precious metals before August 30th, you will be the first to get a signed copy of my brand new book, How to Destroy America in Three Easy Steps, for free. Again, text Ben to 474747. 47 to get started. Okay, so it was a very, very weird first night of the Democratic National Convention. Weird because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so basically, it was a really bad Zoom session, like a really bad Zoom session. It lasted for hours and hours and hours. It had extraordinarily bizarre moments. And as always, Joe Biden was a complete afterthought because Biden is an afterthought in this campaign. The only reason that Joe Biden is even the nominee for the Democrats is because they literally looked at every single other person and they went, okay, we'll take the dead guy. That was pretty much how they came up with Joe Biden as the nominee. Right? They even looked at Bernie Sanders to the extent that we thought he was going to be the nominee. And then Democrats were like, wait a second, we can't nominate a geriatric communist. That seems like a bad idea. So instead, they nominated the corpse in the corner. Well, if you watched the first night of the DNC, Joe Biden, it, it, it sounded like a eulogy for Joe Biden, frankly. It sounded like everybody had sort of messages they wanted to get off their chest about the state of America. And all these messages conflicted. Some of them were, were radical and some of them were, were not radical at all. Some of them were, we're going to unite America. And some of them were, America's garbage. I mean, it was, it was all over the place, but there was one common theme. President Trump is super evil and Joe Biden is literally not even here, right? No one cares about Joe Biden. Joe Biden is completely irrelevant to these proceedings. Kamala Harris is so irrelevant to the proceedings that when Michelle Obama gave her speech, she recorded it like a week ago before Kamala Harris had even been nominated as the VP for Joe Biden. And she couldn't be bothered to re-record it so that she could give some sort of shout out to Kamala Harris, which shows you how much Michelle Obama cares about Kamala Harris being the VP. But the, the real message of this thing was twofold. One, Joe Biden is a complete non-entity and this entire election is about Trump for the Democrats. They don't care about Joe Biden. And why should they? I mean, the guy's lost 1,000 presidential elections before. The only reason he's even relevant is because Barack Obama plucked him from relative obscurity and made him VP. That is the only reason anyone cares about Joe Biden. And now the only reason anyone cares about Joe Biden is as an empty vessel repository for all anti-Trump sentiment. That's all he is. Okay, that is that is the entirety. Somebody who's not completely off-putting, who seems sort of empathetic. This is one of their big messages last night. And who is not really anything, right? He's just sort of, a, he's there. He's just there. He's sitting in the corner. He's like the, uh, he's just he's this, this bizarre kind of, mannequin that they've got standing in the corner giving weird smiles at people and smelling women's hair like that that's that's all joe biden is that was message number one it was all about how trump sucks and it has nothing to do with joe biden message number two and it became very clear that this is the case last night is that the democratic bench is just empty absolutely empty so apparently the new democratic formula for generating popular politicians is elect a democratic president and then make the president's wife the next big thing this is the second straight time democrats have done this right now republicans don't do this Republicans didn't have Laura Bush speaking at like the 2008 convention on behalf of John McCain because Republicans generally don't really assume that the first lady is an elected position in American government that is deserving of the high sort of honor of, of speaking at a convention. It's a non-political position, right? The first lady of the United States or the first gentleman, if a woman were to be elected president, that would be a non-political position. That is a person who's along for the ride. And that, this is why when Bill Clinton in 1992 suggested Hillary would be co-president, everybody was like, hold up a second. We didn't nominate that lady. We nominated you, right? We, we elected you. Nobody elected Hillary Clinton. 
But Democrats have this habit of elevating the first ladies to very political positions. They've done the same thing with Michelle Obama. And Michelle is definitely a smart lady, right? She's been able to morph her own image over time from extraordinarily radical and off-putting to everybody's aunt. And now she's kind of injecting the politics back in, the partisan politics back in. You have to recognize the game that was played. In 2008, this was a lady who was accused of saying, incredibly, that to, to Barack Obama, all this for, for a flag, right? I mean, that there's tape of her doing that. It's unclear what she is saying, but people have read her lips. Or they've tried to. This is the same lady who once said openly that the first time she was proud of her country and her adult life is when her husband was nominated for the presidency. And she's very, very radical in terms of her own sort of political viewpoint on the United States. She's very much in line with this sort of 1619 Project idea that the United States was rooted in evil. And then she morphed into, well, she's the nice lady who makes like vegetable gardens right over at the, over at the White House and is very unifying and is a good mom and all of this. Now, she was always a good mom, but, but that was the part of the personality that they decided to focus in on. And then she wrote this very popular book, Becoming, all about her American journey. And now she's morphing back into politics. They closed last night with Michelle Obama, who's never been elected to an office at all, right? Who is, who is not a relevant political figure at all, who herself has said that she doesn't want to be seen as a relevant political figure. And yet there she was closing out the night. So how, how shallow is the Democratic bench? Their next big thing is the wife of the last big thing, right? That, that's how shallow the bench is. So those were the two messages last night is that Democrats looked at Michelle and they said, we wish that we had nominated you. And Joe Biden is sitting off to the side being a corpse, and that's good enough for them. We're going to jump into the actual the, the actual weirdness of the convention in just one second, because it was very odd. And we're going to get to the, the true message of the convention, which actually happened before the convention. And then we'll get to, or at least the primetime convention, then we'll get to what happened in primetime, which was the stuff that people watch, but not that many. I think the numbers on this thing are really going to be pretty, pretty awful. We'll get to that in just a moment. First, let's talk about your sleep quality. So I will admit to you that I have a little baby, and she's the cutest thing in the world. And she also keeps us up all hours of the night. She was up at two last night. She was up at five last night. She will not sleep through the night. So those moments between her feedings, those are moments when I definitely treasure my Helix Sleep mattress. Helix Sleep has made a mattress that is just for me. Helix Sleep has a quiz. It takes just two minutes to complete. It matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Whether you're a side sleeper or a hot sleeper, whether you like a plush or a firm bed, with Helix, there's no more confusion and no more compromising. Helix Sleep is rated the number one mattress by GQ and Wired Magazine. CNN called it the most comfortable mattress they've ever slept on. Just go to a helixsleep.com slash Ben, take their two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that'll give you the best sleep of your life. They have a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you absolutely will because it's made for you. How could you not love it? Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders just for our listeners right now. Get up to 200 bucks off at helixsleep.com slash Ben. That is helixsleep.com slash Ben. Again, helixsleep.com slash Ben for up to 200 bucks off all mattress orders. You're going to love it because it's made just for you. Helixsleep.com slash Ben. Okay, so before the primetime DNC is when you actually got a solid window onto what the DNC actually is. So in primetime is where you show your best stuff, right? Basically, the the primetime DNC is the dating photo and all the stuff that happens earlier in the day at the DNC is the reality, right? The dating photo, everybody looks like Alyssa Milano circa 1992, right? And then in reality, everybody sort of looks like Rosie O'Donnell circa 1992, right? That's, that, that's the way that, the, that this works in terms of how you present your party to the, to the general public. There's the stuff that you want heavily publicized and then there's the stuff where, okay, so the stuff that's, that's all the stuff that happens before primetime. And there's a lot of stuff happening before primetime. And it was replete with some rather telling moments. And I think that this is going to be wildly underplayed by the media because, of course, they only want to magnify the stuff that makes the Democrats look good. So we begin with the DNC chair announcing full out before the primetime of the DNC. He was on with the Washington Post. He announced that Bernie Sanders was basically one of the driving forces behind the Democratic platform. Now, this is something Bernie himself said last night, but it was at war with what John Kasich was saying, which was the Democrats are actually a moderate party. Here is Tom Perez letting the letting the beans out and spilling the beans uh, about how Bernie Sanders really did shape the DNC platform. The platform is a bold uh, document. It's both uh, inspirational and aspirational. Uh, the input from Senator Sanders and others was invaluable to putting that together. Uh, the vice president and Senator Sanders convened a series of policy groups on critical issues. Okay, so it was Bernie Sanders who was the driving force. Okay, then you got to the actual pre-primetime DNC. And this was replete with strange moments. So one of the pastors who gave a prayer at the, at the pre-primetime DNC, and, and you can see 
how they uh, have put up their, their messaging all around the screen. If you can't actually see it, it says our values, right? And then it's, it shows the, the Black Lives Matter fist twice, right? The Black Lives Matter fist shows up twice in this particular, in this particular iteration of the, image, the imagery that the DNC wants to feature. Okay, so here is a DNC pastor literally saying that America's gonna go to hell if we don't open our borders. You had the nerve to build a wall while at the same time you have in the harbor there in New York, a Statue of Liberty saying, give me your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Jesus will say, America, if you don't get your act together, you can, you may well go to hell. Why? Because in as much as you do it to the least of these, my sisters and brothers, you are also doing it unto me. So open your borders or you're going to hell is a hell of a message. They didn't feature this one in primetime. Other things that were not featured in primetime. So they had these DNC panels. One of the panelists led off the panel. They were going to play the national anthem. And he literally says, this, this is the DNC caucus and council meeting, the youth council, right? This is for the youths, the youths. Okay, so this panelist says, you know, well, we're going to play the national anthem at home, in your basement, if you're watching this. You can either rise or you can kneel for the national anthem. Solid look here for the DNC. Many of the videos and pictures you're about to see were recorded before COVID, which is why the kids are not social distancing. However, the audio was recorded over the past month. You may rise or kneel if you are able for your preference. Okay, so the heart and soul of the DNC is all the stuff that happens not in prime time. Right? Just like the heart and soul of what you look like is the stuff you don't put on your dating profile. Okay, then there was a panelist. This is a solid one. There was a panel yesterday about the Green New Deal. And one of these panelists just says from her couch, presumably in her mother's house, that the Green New Deal should be utilized to full-on destroy capitalism. Again, stuff that ain't going to be featured. This is at the DNC caucus and council meeting, the Youth Council. The Youth Council is the future of the Democratic Party. So if you're wondering, the future of the Democratic Party, it looks a lot like AOC and not very much like Joe Biden. Here is this panelist saying it's time to destroy capitalism. This future that we all want, that we're all trying to build, um, really is about the destruction of colonization, white supremacy, and capitalism. We must, uh, we must really move away from these uh, systems and these frameworks if we really want to live in a future that does have a regenerative economy and um, does enable liberation and equity for our communities. Ah, kill capitalism and kill colonization. I'm not sure, like, who's, uh, were we colonizing the moon? Like, well, what are we talking about here? So that's the solid stuff happening again before primetime. Gwen Carr, who's Eric Garner's mom, also appeared prior to primetime and suggested we, can, this, this may have actually been during primetime, and said we can't let things settle down, right? We can't, under no circumstances can we let things settle down. It seems like we might want to let things settle down considering our cities have been burning for months at this point, but here's Eric Garner's mom. I know when my son was murdered, there was a big uprising, but then it settled down. We can't let things settle down. We have to go to the politicians and we have to hold their feet to the fire because otherwise the big uprising is not going to mean a lot. Okay, and uh, and so there she was saying, we can't let things settle down and Joe Biden giving randomly a fist, uh, ran randomly very, very excited. Finally, in the pre-convention, the pre-primetime convention, Ayanna Presley, the Ringo star of the squad, she actually praised the quote-unquote protesters who were rising up in Portland, you know, the people trying to burn down federal buildings and throwing fireworks at cops and stuff. She, she was very, very happy with this. Here's Ayanna Presley. Right now, we are managing against converging public health and economic crises amid a national reckoning on racial injustice in this country. Communities from Boston to Portland and everywhere in between are rising up to demand accountability and divestment from broken systems. Okay, good stuff right there. She's looking at the, the rising up in Portland. It's been great. It's been great for the country. Okay, so now we finally get to prime time. So here is the positive phase that the Democrats want to put out there. And here's the problem. It's not just a face, it is many faces, like lots of different faces. The Democrats are all things to all people, except the only thing that unifies them is the glue of orange man bad. Trump is really bad. The glue is not Joe Biden. Right? Joe Biden, again, is just that stuffed animal in the corner. Right? He's just in the closet with E.T., Joe Biden. But the real glue here is orange man bad. And so this led to some kind of awkward moments. The whole thing was very awkward and kind of off-putting. The only person who really had a good night was Michelle Obama, who is very good on camera. Everybody else was pretty terrible on camera. We'll get to that in just one moment. First, let us talk about keeping your home safe and secure. So when somebody arrives at your door and knocks on your door, 
you may not be home. And one of the ways that robbers sometimes gain access to your house is they knock on the door, make sure you're not home, and then they break in. Well, with Ring, you are always at home. Ring has security products for every corner of your home, inside and out. Best of all, you can see it all in one simple app. With Ring, you can keep an eye on your home no matter where you are right from your phone. If someone stops by or something's going on, Ring lets you know. It's peace of mind anytime knowing that your home is protected. Whatever you call home, Ring has everything you need to protect it. See and speak to whomever is at your door from anywhere with video doorbells. Keep an eye on every corner of your house with easy to install indoor and outdoor cams. I love Ring and make sure that I can keep an eye on my kids no matter where I am. Because when they are at home, they're frequently attempting to do physical bodily harm to themselves. And so I need to keep an eye on my property just for that alone. Forget about the fact that I actually care about security and want to know what's going on at my front gate. Get a special offer on the Ring Welcome Kit at ring.com slash Ben. It comes with Ring Video Doorbell 3 and Chime Pro, the perfect way to start your Ring experience. Plus, free two-day shipping. Go to ring.com slash Ben. That is ring.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Ring.com slash Ben. Okay, so as I say, this whole thing was very awkward because normally a convention is where some of the party business gets done. It basically is a giant party. I mean, I went to the 2012 Republican National Convention in Tampa, and even that one it was a giant party. It's a lot of fun. There are a lot of kind of hangouts that are going on. It, it, it's sort of like Comic-Con for political nerds, essentially. Well, the audience last night looked absolutely bored. The DNC made the very odd decision to put cameras in the houses of random DNC fans, and they looked like, alternatively, they couldn't wait to get up and go pee during the commercial break that never came, or like they were going to absolutely fall asleep, fall into a coma. The footage, the, the cutaways to them, they, they just look like, okay, are we on camera right now? Uh, am, am I supposed to like be here? It's, it's like you are during any sort of Zoom conference. Like any Zoom conference, you just hope that you don't make enough noise that the camera automatically flashes to you because you're actually in your underwear and scratching yourself in the nether regions. That That's what it looked like over at the DNC last night. Okay, so... Time to contrast the prime time and the pre-prime time. So as you'll remember, in the pre-prime time, they played the national anthem and told people to kneel or rise for the national anthem, which is a hell of a take. At the actual DNC, like the prime time DNC, they played the national anthem. Very, very patriotic stuff. Nobody kneeling at all. And actually, it was quite a beautiful rendition of the national anthem, I thought. They had a bunch of people cut together sort of a Zoom version of the national anthem. It was quite nice. I mean, you can, like, you can pretend that you like patriotism, I guess, if you're the Democratic Party. And when you're not openly celebrating Colin Kaepernick kneeling for the national anthem and suggesting that it's the anthem of a cruel racist nation, Biden's grandkids then emerge to lead the Pledge of Allegiance, which, again, Democrats have said is bad because it includes the phrase under God. Right. So but but now it's good again. Right. Again, th this is the dating profile for the Democrats. We're not that crazy. We like the national anthem and the Pledge of Allegiance. And then Sato Voce, it's like, well, but if you kneel for the national anthem, that's the best of America. And if you say the Pledge of Allegiance is too weirdly religious, that's also the best of America. So here they were pretending they like the Pledge of Allegiance, not the kids. I'm sure the kids love the Pledge. I'm sure that they all love the Pledge of Allegiance. Here are the kids. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, they said indivisible, under God, guys. with liberty and justice for all. Now, let me just say, if they play this at the RNC, the Democrats get very, very upset because they said under God. Very, very bad. Okay, then the Democrats opened. Who did they open with? They opened with famed woman of the people, Eva Longoria, from like Desperate Housewives, who has become a political figure in her own right. She was featured at the last convention in 2016, that super successful convention. She introduced this thing, and then she introduced regular people. Ah, oh, the regular people. Hollywood's bizarre fixation with the Democratic Party and the Democratic Party's bizarre fixation with Hollywood took on some really weird overtones in this particular DNC. As we'll see, the way the DNC concluded the evening was probably the weirdest way that any evening of a convention has ever been concluded. I mean, it was super, super odd. We'll get to that in a little bit. Here was Eva Longoria opening this thing up because we all need to hear from the lady who hasn't been relevant since Desperate Housewives. The past few months have tested us all. We've lost more than 170,000 family members and friends to COVID. This tragedy is compounded by the loss of jobs and income. But it's not just the past few months. The past four years have left us as a nation diminished and divided. And yet, in the middle of the fear and sorrow and the uncertainty, people have come together because they know we are better than this. America is better than this. Okay, so this was the message, is more, so more in sorrow than in anger, 
we are better than this. America's better than this. We are the uniters. Yes, sure, we're, we've been allowing people to run roughshod through America's major cities and burn crap. Sure, we've been suggesting for literally years at this point that the United States is inherently quite evil. Sure, we have been promulgating bizarre conspiracy theories about the 2016 election for five years, four or five years at this point. But we've been out here uniting America. We're super big into uniting America. It's what we are into every day, the uniting of America. So this, this, was their, this was their message. It was about empathy and unity. And I know you're sitting to yourself going, wait a second, empathy and unity, like, haven't, been, haven't we been watching people burning cities to the ground? And, and as for your, your unity, haven't we been watching you pretend that Southern states are evil because they're not Andrew Cuomo? And the answer is yes, all of that is real and all of that has been happening, but that's not the dating profile, guys. The dating profile is unity, unity. So basically what the Democrat, this Democratic strategy last night was Donald Trump is a mean man. Right? It wasn't about his policies. Very little was discussed about his policies. And there was very little focus put on working men and women across the country, right? There was very little about the Democrats' economic plans, how they're going to make life better for working people in the United States, which is usually something they focus on, the blue-collar workers. Instead, it was sort of like a, a bizarre recap of 2016 where everything was culturally focused and focused in on Trump's character. Now, it didn't work in 2016. Maybe it'll work this time because people are more upset about COVID. But it's a, it's a weird strategy to take, right? Because you could theoretically talk about the competence level more than anything else. And this is what Michelle Obama did, right? That's why she's the most successful politician of any of these clowns. But that really isn't what they went for. Instead, what they went for overall was, isn't the country just feeling too mean right now? And I'm, I'm looking at Democrats who have been involved in canceling anything they don't like and suggesting everybody they don't like is a racist and believing that America is filled to the brim with bigots and horrible people. And I'm just thinking, you guys are the expositors of American unity? Truly? You want an overarching government that crams down on 49% of the population, the political preferences of 51% of the population. You're looking forward to a federal government overriding fundamental American rights, ranging from freedom of association to freedom of religion. And you guys are the unifiers and the empathetic ones. But that requires a little bit of background knowledge. So most people don't have that background knowledge. And so what they see instead is look at these nice people and they're saying nice things. There's so, so much, so much niceness, so much niceness. So it was a made for Hollywood version of reality that included some bizarre moments. And the Democrats featured George Floyd's brother. He asked for a moment of silence. Now, again, not a person in America thinks that George Floyd should have died. No one, right? Not a Republican, not a Democrat. Nobody thinks George Floyd should be dead. Okay, and as it turns out, the fact pattern may be that he actually did not die of the knee to the neck, right? The original state autopsy suggested that he didn't die of the knee to the neck, that he actually died because he had some pretty significant pre-existing drug use and medical conditions. The Democrats start with George Floyd's br brother asking for a moment of silence and talking about George Floyd, because this is sort of a Hollywood production, the, the DNC, the focus is not on how we solve the problem of police brutality. Instead, the focus is on, on talking about George Floyd's character, which is a, it's kind of a weird focus because George Floyd had a very long criminal record. The, the story of George Floyd that makes it tragic is not actually George Floyd's criminality, right? I mean, what, what makes it tragic is that George Floyd shouldn't have died and now he's dead. But instead, what was put out there was the legacy of George Floyd as, as like a human being. And if you're going to talk about that, then it's, it's almost impossible not to talk about the fact that he did, he was arrested and did time in jail for armed robbery in which he pointed a gun at a pregnant woman, right? That's not relevant to his actual death. But because you're trying to create uh, an overall narrative, instead, you, you sort of put out that message, which is a, which is a strange and, and kind of counterfactual message to the actual problem, which is police brutality, which does crop up. So here was that message last night. My brother George was selfless. He always made sacrifices for his family, friends, and even complete strangers. George had a giving spirit, a spirit that has shown up on streets around our nation and around the world. Please join me in a moment of silence to honor George and the many other souls we lost to hate and injustice. And when this moment ends, let's make sure we never stop saying their names. OK, and the names that he's talking about are, of course, the names of people who have died in altercations with police. He's not talking about, as the Democratic Party will never talk about, the names of black Americans who are killed in inner city violence, which is significantly more prevalent than cops killing black Americans under disputed circumstances. OK, we're going to get to more of this in just one second. First, let us talk about the fact that 
what you could really use these days is a nice couch. I mean, everybody's watching this stuff from Zoom, right? I mean, you're, you're doing everything you can on Zoom these days. If you've been listening to the show for a while, you probably heard me talk about my Helix mattress. So exciting news. Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called Allform. They're making premium customizable sofas and chairs shipped directly to your door. So what makes an Allform sofa really cool? Well, for starters, it is the easiest way you can customize a sofa using premium materials and at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. You can pick your fabric. It is spill stain and scratch resistant, the sofa color, the color of the legs, sofa size and shape to make sure it's perfect for you and your home. They've got armchairs and love seats all the way up to an eight seat sectional. So there's something for everybody. We've got one at home. It is just fantastic. I have an all form sofa. We picked out a three seat sofa with chaise in the sand color with espresso legs. If getting a sofa without trying it in store sounds a little risky, you really don't need to worry about it because you get a hundred days to decide if you want to keep it. More than three months. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. They also have a forever warranty, like literally forever. So it's durable. It's super comfortable. It looks fantastic. And it's made just for you. To find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash Ben. And Allform is offering 20% off all orders for our listeners at allform.com slash Ben right now, which is a great deal. 20% off all orders when you go to allform.com slash Ben. That's allform.com slash Ben. Okay, then we get to the actual politicians in the DNC. And so we begin with the also rounds, meaning the people who were once sort of considered for the VP slot and then were completely ignored because they didn't fit the bill. So Amy Klobuchar was allowed like 60 seconds to talk about why she doesn't like Trump. And again, that is the only message here, right? There's no message about why Biden is good. It's all about how Trump, Donald Trump is bad. Here is Amy Klobuchar passed over because the Democrats decided they needed to check intersectional boxes. So here is Klobuchar, who won many more votes than Kamala Harris, but is not the vice presidential candidate, making a joke about Trump hating the post office or something. I believe that the right to vote is fundamental and the post office is essential. You know, the president may hate the post office, but he's still going to have to send them a change of address card come January. <laughs> and then there is Gretchen Whitmer, the, the governor of Michigan, who has presided over a pretty significant death toll in the state of Michigan. In fact, if you look at state by state in the United States, it's one of the worst hit states. Right? She, she was one of the people who was apparently shipping the old people back to the nursing homes with COVID. Right? That was one of the actual policies in the state of Michigan. Michigan currently ranks ninth in America in terms of death rate per million, surpassed only by New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Louisiana, Rhode Island, D.C., and Mississippi. And so here she was last night saying that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will lead by example. Uh, again, the, the way the Democrats mean lead by example is we're not actually going to do any leading. We're just going to have Joe Biden say things, sort of the same way that Joe Biden says he wants a national mask mandate with no empowering authority and no actual plan. That's leading by example. The way Gretchen Whitmer leads by example is by banning people from buying seeds at the local store while allowing her husband to go boating or something. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will lead by example. It'll be science, not politics or ego, that will drive their decisions. They know the health of our people goes hand in hand with the strength of our economy. They know action begets action. Over the past few months, we've learned what's essential, rising to the challenge, not denying it. Um, by rising to the challenge, she means that uh, she did a terrible job in Michigan. And people who live in Michigan know this is the case. Then Muriel Bowser, who's briefly considered on the VP ticket, right, the DC mayor, who's most famous for painting stuff on sidewalks while people get shot in her city, she, uh, she emerged to talk about her amazing record at the DNC. The story of our nation's capital is a story of reckoning. It was here that John Lewis and Dr. King spoke on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. But we have to do something too. Each and every one of us challenge our own biases. If we see something, do something. Together we can turn this reckoning into a reimagining of a nation where we the people means all the people. And she shot this from directly above her giant Black Lives Matter mural uh, that is that is located in the middle of the street in Washington, D.C. It hasn't sh stopped people from getting shot in Washington, D.C., but she at least gets to talk about it. Finally, the Democrats moved on to Andrew Cuomo. OK, so they're big picture because, again, they don't have very good policies. In fact, no policies so far as I can see. Uh, because the Democratic pitch is that Donald Trump is a mean, bad man who is mean and bad, they're focusing in on COVID, right? COVID is the big thing. This is the overarching meta narrative is that Donald Trump doesn't care about you. And that is why your family member died of COVID. But you know who does care about you? Andrew Cuomo, the worst governor in America. So they trotted out Andrew Cuomo. Now, I don't know what kind of perverse sense of humor you have to have to trot out Andrew Cuomo to talk about success and failure in COVID. This is like trotting out the captain of the Titanic to talk about avoiding icebergs. 
Okay, the headlines from New York these days are astonishing. It'll be things like in the New York Times, like New York handled the first wave. Will they handle the second? If by handle the first wave, made everyone died, all of the humans died, then sure, great job, Andrew Cuomo. But Andrew Cuomo was trotted out at the DNC and he made some, um, he made some weird comments. He, uh, he suggested, for example, that COVID was mostly a metaphor, a metaphor that killed 33,000 people in his state. But uh, that's a hell of a metaphor. It's a good metaphor right there. Here was, here's New York Governor Andrew Cuomo talking about how COVID is a symptom, not an illness. COVID just demonstrates how we were already so divided. What COVID mostly suggests is that you probably shouldn't cover up nursing home deaths. His state deliberately covered up nursing home deaths, said there were 6,600 of them, there were 11,000. Here is uh, the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, who, when he is not being grilled by his brother about his nostril size, is letting old people die in his state. We went through hell, but we have learned much. We know that our problems go beyond the COVID virus. COVID is the symptom, not the illness. Our nation is in crisis. And in many ways, COVID is just a metaphor. A virus attacks when the body is weak and when it cannot defend itself. Over these past few years, America's body politic has been weakened. In many ways, it's not a metaphor. In like the ways where people were suffocating to death, it was not such a metaphor. In a lot of ways, it wasn't a metaphor, like when people were not allowed to see their, their loved ones as they lay dying, as their lungs basically ceased to function. It turned out not such a good metaphor. It was mostly not a metaphor. According to Andrew Cuomo, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for his excellent leadership. And, and then he talked about divisions in America. Andrew Cuomo, the guy who's right now saying, I'm going to ban people from other states because New York handled this great, but everybody else handled it terribly. Well, he sits on, by state, the second worst death per million rate in America. The only state that surpasses is New Jersey. Here, here is Andrew Cuomo suggesting that we've learned how bad things can get when we're divided. That's why we have to unite, unite around my garbage policy. Uh, the, the temerity that it takes to trot out Andrew Cuomo at your convention after he has presided over the greatest natural loss of life in the United States, by natural, I mean illness related, loss of life in the United States in decades is astonishing. I mean, the gall is just incredible. Here is Andrew Cuomo. Today, we trail the world in defeating COVID. We have over 5 million cases. Americans learned a critical lesson, how vulnerable we are when we are divided and how many lives can be lost when our government is incompetent. But we learned something else, my friends. We saw the negative, but we also saw the positive. As they proved their way failed, we proved that our way succeeded. Uh, which way would be that? Would that be like, um, what now? Andrew Cuomo being trotted out as a success story is one of the most extraordinary examples of gaslighting I think I've ever seen in my entire life. That, that is an incredible, incredible thing. It's like OJ Simpson talking about how to prevent murder. My, my God, people. Wow, wow, wow. It, by the way, if you want to talk about shamelessness, wait until we get to the next person that the Democrats had speak. They had a woman from Arizona whose father died of COVID, speak at the convention and say, maybe the most shameless thing I've ever heard on a Democratic National Convention stage. Her name was Kristen Orkiza. Literally, her entire billing is father died of coronavirus. That's the, it's the only reason that she is here, right, is because she's a Democrat and her dad died of coronavirus. And she blames Trump for this. This is one of the most shameless things I have ever seen at a political convention. It, it is truly shameless. Okay, I feel awful for the lady because anybody who has a relative die, that's a horrible, horrible experience. But this is a shameless political move by the Democrats to bring out a woman whose parent died of COVID to blame Trump and do it in the way that she does is on a political and a moral level despicable. I mean, really despicable. Listen to what she says. It's, it's patently crazy. Here, here we go. My dad, Mark Anthony Urquiza, should be here today, but he isn't. He had faith in Donald Trump. He voted for him, listened to him, believed him and his mouthpieces when they said that coronavirus was under control and going to disappear, that it was okay to end social distancing rules before it was safe, and that if you had no underlying health conditions, you'd probably be fine. My dad was a healthy 65-year-old. His only pre-existing condition was trusting Donald Trump and for that, he paid with his life. So apparently only Trump voters have died. Anybody who listens to Trump died? If you didn't listen to Trump, you're fine. All those people in New York who died, entirely Republicans. To blame Trump for this guy dying of COVID 
I mean, this is equivalent to when when there was an ad in 2012 blaming Mitt Romney and Bain Capital for firing a guy so his wife would later die of cancer. Like to, the the idea that like, is there any evidence that he just went out there willy nilly and started m- macking on on people who had covid because he believed Trump? Hey, that, that's such an unbelievable statement that that her dad is dead because he trusted Trump as opposed to what? Like, it, you know what this is? Honestly, it, that sort of of take on life is a bizarrely ritualistic take on what it takes to mitigate risk. That if you just don't vote for Trump, I guess you're immune to COVID now. If you don't believe Trump and you pay no attention to Trump, then apparently you're immune from COVID, which is weird because every single state that leads in death in the United States is a blue state. Every single one, all of them. The only one in the top 10 in terms of death per millions that is not a blue state is Mississippi. Every other one is a blue state. So I, I'm, I'm failing to see the connection between you believe Donald Trump and you die of COVID. That, that, that's an absurd contention, truly absurd. But the Democrats trotted that out in prime time last night. Okay, in a second, we're gonna get to the, the actual political part of the convention. And this was really three separate speakers who were featured in the political part of the convention. And they gave very conflicting messages. One was John Kasich. Oh God, no, please God, no, not John Kasich. Bernie Sanders, he shows up again, he's back. And Michelle Obama, the greatest, wisest, and most wonderful of all human beings. We'll get to all of that in just one second. First, let us talk about the fact that you're spending an awful lot of time these days with blue light technologies, meaning anything with a screen. So are your kids. It can give you headaches. It can make you not sleep as well at night. It can give you eye strain. Literally any amount of excessive screen time with the digital device creates eye strain. Common symptoms from too much blue light, headaches, blurry vision, dry, tired eyes, trouble sleeping. Well, why don't you get some Felix Grey glasses? They're fantastic. They filter up to 90% of all blue light and 15 times more where it matters most using an industry-leading lens technology proprietary to Felix Grey. Nine in 10 Felix Grey customers report significant symptom relief. Felix Grey features highly curated, timeless styles made from Italian acetate, makes them stylish, durable, lightweight, and really comfortable. Trust your eyes to the most trusted brand in blue light, over 250,000 happy customers. Order online. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges, always. All orders include a custom hard case and lens cloth. I've got my Felix Grays. They look great. They reduce my eye strain, because again, I spend a lot of time on screens. If you're getting your kids ready for back to school, you can shop Felix Gray Blue Light Glasses for kids from August 24th to August 30th for 15% off kids' glasses. The offer apply only to kids' glasses. Go to felixgrayglasses.com slash Ben for the absolute best quality blue light filtering glasses on the market. Again, they have proprietary technology. It makes them better than anything else on the market. Check out felixgrayglasses.com slash Ben, F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash Ben. Do what I did. Start taking care of your eyes. Feel better. Work smarter. Free shipping, free returns, free exchanges. Always felixgrayglasses.com slash Ben. Okay, we're going to get to the heavily political arena of the convention, the, the Kasich, Sanders, and Michelle Obama triumvirate. First, got to tell you about exclusive membership over at The Daily Wire, All Access. All Access members get to join All Access Live. That is our exclusive live stream discussions hosted every night by each of the hosts, including me. This Thursday, August 20th, we'll be doing a very special live stream watch party covering the DNC's biggest speakers with The Daily Wire's own Matt Walsh. The stream starts at 8.45 p.m. Eastern, 5.45 p.m. Pacific. Don't miss this big opportunity to tune in and mock, I mean, mock watch, the final night of the DNC with Matt Walsh, whose low-key brand of humor I feel might be a little biting. All Access membership also features exclusive access to live online discussions with hosts, writers, special guests, along with not one, but two leftist tears tumblers with your membership, as well as early and sometimes exclusive access to new Daily Wire products. So head on over to dailywire.com slash Shapiro right now to get 20% off All Access with coupon code ACCESS. That's dailywire.com slash Shapiro with coupon code ACCESS to get 20% off your membership. Also, this Friday, we're doing a backstage. Now, if you've never seen one of these, you really should check it out. I get together with all the other hosts here at Daily Wire. It's a lot of fun for them. They smoke cigars. I eat an unreasonable amount of popcorn. I get really, really cynical and nasty. This Friday, 4 p.m. Pacific, go check it out. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. So as I've been saying, there are variegated pitches for the Democrats last night. Pitch number one was Trump botched covid Let us show you this great leader, Andrew Cuomo. Hmm, Not the world's best pitch. Pitch number two was, we're super patriotic, except when we're telling people to kneel for the national anthem. Hmm. And then they trotted out pitch number three, which is, here are our token Republicans. Here they are. They're here to yell about how much they don't like Donald Trump. So they brought out John Kasich. Oh, yes. Oh, God, no. Please, God, no. Not John Kasich, the former governor of Ohio. Now, Governor Kasich, for some odd reason, decided to do 
his speech from an actual crossroads. In case you didn't get the metaphor, we're at a crossroads, gang. So he literally stood at a crossroads in the middle of a field, like the scarecrow in Wizard of Oz, because he has no brain. And on one side of the crossroads was, quit the 2016 presidential race in March to give Ted Cruz a shot at defeating Donald Trump. That was the crossroads he didn't take. He took the other one that said, stay in the race long enough to guarantee Trump the nomination and then speak four years later at the DNC and make an ass of yourself. That was the crossroads he chose. But he spoke about being at the crossroads while literally standing at a crossroads in case you didn't get the metaphor like Tom Hanks at the end of Castaway. Here was John Kasich, a raisin in the sun. Sometimes elections represent a real choice, a choice we make as individuals and as a nation about which path we want to take when we've come to challenging times. America is at that crossroads today. I'm a lifelong Republican, but that attachment holds second place to my responsibility to my country. That's why I've chosen to appear at this convention. In normal times, something like this would probably never happen. But these are not normal times. No, I feel like basically anywhere there's a spotlight, you can find John Kasich. My favorite John Kasich clip was back during the 2016 campaign. My favorite was when he went into a section of Williamsburg in Brooklyn campaigning, and he started lecturing Orthodox Jews on, on what it says in the Bible. Did you know it's what it says in the Bible? Like, nope, they, they kind of do. Actually, it turns out John Kasich, that dude is the worst. He's the worst. So I'm glad that you Democrats have him. Welcome to the party. I, I hope you enjoy this gift that we gave you in John Kasich. Okay, so the juxtaposition of John Kasich with Bernie Sanders is pretty astonishing. It was pretty astonishing because Kasich, at the, in the middle of his speech, he's talking about the wonders of Joe Biden, dead man standing over here. Here is my late departed Joe Biden. And he says, don't worry, you know, I'm a Republican. You think that I would vote for somebody who's going to go radical? I'd never vote for anybody who's going to go radical. Joe Biden isn't going to go radical. I mean, look, the man's dead. He can't go radical. Here is John Kasich, a man who, again, mostly resembles a crumbled up piece of paper in your pocket or a seat from the local restaurant that went through the washing machine in your jeans. Here's John Kasich <laughs> talking about how Joe Biden won't go radical because he's not alive anymore. I'm sure there are Republicans and independents who couldn't imagine crossing over to support a Democrat. They fear Joe may turn sharp left and leave them behind. I don't believe that because I know the measure of the man. It's reasonable, faithful, respectful. And you know, no one pushes Joe around. Um, he's reasonable. He's fine. No one pushes him around. No one pushes him around. Quick cut to Bernie Sanders. So Bernie Sanders speaks at the convention last night. And he's like, by the way, you know who now runs this party? It's me. Me, a communist white man. I'm back. And I'm going to tell you how John Kasich, he was saying that Joe Biden won't be pushed around. <laughs> well, let me explain to you that I push him around all the time. In fact, I actually have Joe on a gurney in the back. Just for fun, I push him around side to side, back and forth. It's really fun. In fact, my ideas are now the mainstream. Remember when they used to pretend that I was not a mainstream politician? Now, I've basically taken them over like the face hugger, an alien. I went on Joe Biden's face, and then I went down into his body, and I burst forth in full socialist flowering. Bernie Sanders, explaining that not only will he push Joe Biden around, but he is Joe Biden now. He just wears a Joe Biden mask like the guy from Silence of the Lambs. Here we go, Bernie Sanders. Our campaign ended several months ago, but our movement continues and is getting stronger every day. Many of the ideas we fought for that just a few years ago were considered radical are now mainstream. So is that a bit of a conflicting message? John Kasich's like, they won't go radical, guys. They won't go radical. And I can assure you they won't go radical because I know Joe Biden and Joe Biden is not alive. And then Bernie's like, I can assure you, we definitely have gone radical and uh, you're going to have to get over it. I believe Bernie because Tom Perez said before the convention that Bernie wrote the convention and wrote, wrote, the, uh, wrote the platform. And then... Bernie Sanders uh, jumped into the main message of the evening because, again, all of this is all over the place, right? Biden is a moderate, but he's also a radical. Biden is very patriotic, but also kneeling for the anthem is very patriotic. America is a wonderful patriotic place filled with great people, but also America is systemically racist. But there's one unifying message, and that is Donald Trump is not normal. So here is Bernie Sanders saying Donald Trump is not normal. He is orange and looks like an orange and also is bad, like an orange from The Godfather. Whenever you see an orange, somebody's going to get shot. Donald Trump is like orange for the American people. During this president's term, the unthinkable has become normal. He has tried to prevent people from voting, 
undermine the U.S. Postal Service, deployed the military and federal agents against peaceful protesters, threatened to delay the election, and suggested that he will not leave office if he loses. This is not normal, and we must never treat it like it is. Tell me more about normality, communist who has praised every evil regime from Cuba to China to, to the Soviet Union. Tell me more, Bernie, about not normal, about not normal Bernie Sanders. OK, then finally, the Democrats got to the most beloved person in America. I mean, by poll numbers, this is true. Michelle Obama, who, as we say, has undergone a complete reinvention twice. So first there was Michelle Obama, radical life partner to Barack Obama. Then there was Michelle Obama, wonderful, apolitical first lady, beloved of all Americans. And now there's Michelle Obama, political figure, and she's back. So Michelle Obama speaks last night. Now, again, it's weird for the first lady, the last first lady to speak at a convention that doesn't involve her husband, really. Like, I don't I believe Laura Bush did not speak, certainly not in prime time, at the 2008 convention for for John McCain. Um, but Michelle Obama is a political figure. One of the things that is so perverse about the Obamas generally is the is the high level lying. I mean, they're really good at it, really good at it. So some people are just bad liars. Like Kamala Harris is a terrible liar. She happens to be an awful liar. Every time she lies, she breaks into the Joker laugh. As I always tell my children when we watch animated films, the way that you can tell the bad guy is the bad guy always laughs a lot. Bad guys always seem to be having the most fun in the movies. It doesn't matter what movie you watch. Like it could be a Marvel movie. It could be a it could be a cartoon movie. Whenever you have somebody who laughs like a crazy person, that's the bad guy because bad guys have all the fun. Kamala Harris laughs. It's her, it's her tell, the crazy Joker laugh every time she lies. Not the Obamas. The Obamas are really smooth. So they've been able to portray themselves as above the fray and really nice people who get along with it. Not partisan knife fighters in any way, which, of course, is utterly untrue. Barack Obama was one of the most vicious partisan knife fighters in my political lifetime. It's amazing. Amazing that he was able to come off as empathetic. I mean, the guy's really gifted that way. Michelle turns out to be a fairly radical character herself. Again, a lady who in 2008 openly said the only reason that she'd been proud of her country in her adult lifetime was the nomination of her husband, which is an amazing statement. I've been proud of this country when Barack Obama was president. I've been proud of this country when Donald Trump was president. I've been proud of this country when Bill Clinton and George W. Bush were president. My pride in the United States of America is not reliant on who has been nominated for president of the United States. Doesn't mean I like everybody who's been president. Doesn't mean I like any of the nominees. But my pride in the country goes a little deeper than that. Michelle Obama has always been fairly radical. She's always been really political, very, very political. But Last night, she had to portray herself as an apolitical figure and the media doing their best to, to prop her up on this one. She began her speech by saying she hates politics, which is just laughable. Michelle Obama hating politics? Sure, I'm, I'm sure Michelle Obama despises politics, by which she means that she absolutely adores politics, has been in it nearly her entire life. You know that I tell you exactly what I'm feeling. You know I hate politics, but you also know that I care about this nation. You know how much I care about all of our children. Okay, so I find this stuff kind of off-putting. I mean, shockingly, I'm not Captain Empathy. But this is the Democrat pitch. So in the end, the Democratic pitch is going to be Donald Trump doesn't care about people like you, which is the biggest question in any presidential election. Usually it's, does this person care about people like you? Trump did that. He actually won that argument over Hillary, who appeared to be completely non-caring about people who are not like her. Michelle Obama makes the case that Trump is not Captain Caring, which is obviously true. Right? And that she is very, so it all comes down to empathy. Now, I've, I've, as I've mentioned before, there are entire books written about the problems with empathy in American politics. There's an entire book by a guy named Paul Bloom, who's a social scientist, called Against Empathy, the case for rational compassion, right? There's a difference between having compassion for somebody on a rational level and empathy that forces you to abandon your kind of concerns about people who are not the person with whom you're empathizing. But Democrats have decided that elections ought to be referenda on empathy, which always is going to cut in favor of the, Dem the Democrats because for Democrats, empathy means us doing something for you, no matter how bad it is, no matter whether it's counterproductive. And Democrats can always say, we'll spend more money. Right? Well, empathy can be equated with money in this particular iteration. So their case is Donald Trump is not empathetic. We, however, are empathetic. We are classy. We take the high road. So here's Michelle Obama saying the Democrats take the high road, which um, is weird because I've been alive. So no, you don't. No, you don't. I'm old enough to remember when Joe Biden, your current presidential nominee, said that Mitt Romney was going to put black people back in slavery. He was going to put them back in chains. 
I'm old enough to remember when the Obama campaign ran with the line that Mitt Romney was a sexist because he had a binder of women he was examining for a VP candidate. Sort of like, hmm, Joe Biden having a binder full of women he was examining, examining for his VP candidate. I'm old enough to remember when Barack Obama threatened the banks by saying the pitchforks are out front and I can just let them come get you. But according to Michelle Obama, they always take the high road, which is just the greatest myth in American politics. Over the past four years, a lot of people have asked me, when others are going so low, does going high still really work? My answer, going high is the only thing that works. Because when we go low, when we use those same tactics of degrading and dehumanizing others, we just become part of the ugly noise that's drowning out everything else. Okay, she, she's really good at this, right? She's doing it without an audience. She understands that it has to be like an Oprah direct to camera moment. She, she's very, like just on an aesthetic level, you have to acknowledge that she is very good at her job right here. That doesn't mean that she's telling the truth because as it turns out, when it comes to degrading and dehumanizing and mischaracterizing your opposition and not taking the high road, Michelle Obama did plenty of that last night. Most obvious example, she suggested that the Trump administration throws people in cages. Okay, so here she was last night suggesting the Trump administration throws people in cages. They see our leaders labeling fellow citizens enemies of the state while emboldening torch-bearing white supremacists. They watch in horror as children are torn from their families and thrown into cages and pepper spray and rubber bullets are used on peaceful protesters for a photo op. Sadly, this is the America that is on display for the next generation. Weird, because the America that was on display for during your administration was complete, utter chaos in Ferguson, Missouri, complete, utter chaos in Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. So, um, yeah. Also, I seem to remember that, you know, where those cages got started, you know, where they got started, those those horrible, horrible cages um, with with Barack Obama. I have some bad news from the Obama administration era. Uh, those cages began with forced separation policy promulgated by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. They began under the Obama administration, which led to that famous botch where the media started putting out a photo of kids in cages that actually was from the Obama time. But don't worry, she, take, she took the high road right there. And the, the Trump administration is only using rubber bullets and tear gas against peaceful protesters. There are no actual rioters in the streets. They don't exist. They're gone. But she's taking the high road, guys. Very, very high. Very, very high road. Also, she says that the White House doesn't care about black people, which is also taking the high road. So she says that there is a never ending list of black people who've been murdered by the police, a never ending list of black people murdered by the police. Um, well, actually, according to The Washington Post, there are a grand total of 15 black people who were killed unarmed by the cops last year. Fifteen. So that seems like an ending list, not a never ending. List. It seems like mostly an ending list. And in the vast majority of those cases, the people who were, quote unquote, unarmed actually were either going for a cop's gun or using some other type of weapon to attack a cop or were physically in an altercation with a cop. But apparently it's a never ending list. And the White House won't say black lives matter. The White House won't say Black Lives Matter because they don't want to mimic the rhetoric of the actual Black Lives Matter movement because the phrase Black Lives Matter is a semantic trap that has been laid by Democrats. It is a semantically overloaded term, right? That is why the White House has not used the term Black Lives Matter because it is unclear what it means. I've mentioned this several times. It means one, the utterly unobjectionable idea that Black Lives Matter just as much as any other lives in the United States. Two, the perfectly objectionable idea that the United States is systemically racist and that people are targeting black people for death, which is utterly untrue. The vast majority of black people who are killed in the United States are killed by other black people, just like the vast majority of white people in the United States who are killed are killed by other white people. OK, so that's a completely arguable idea. And then finally, there's the completely inarguable idea that you should not be endorsing the Black Lives Matter organization, a radical, awful, terrible group. OK, but she says that there's a never ending list. Again, this is Michelle Obama, who is just the greatest, wisest mom. Mom is disappointed in us. That was the method. That was sort of the, the message of this, because she's everybody's mom. Michelle Obama, that's how she's portrayed by the media. Mom is disappointed in you. And she's disappointed in you because the White House won't say that Black Lives Matter while endless numbers of black people are being murdered, apparently by the system, which isn't true, but she's going to push that line anyway. As George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and a never-ending list of innocent people of color continue to be murdered, stating the simple fact that a black life matters is still met with derision from the nation's highest office. Never ending list, guys. She because whenever we look to this White House for some leadership or consolation or any semblance of steadiness, what we get instead is chaos, okay, division, so and a total and utter lack 
of empathy. Okay, that, and again, it's going to come back time and time again to empathy, and we're going to blink very slowly for the camera. Lack of empathy and caring, right? That's the shtick. That's the shtick, is that Trump should care. Now, she's never going to mention the fact that there are full-on riots in major American cities that have taken more lives, by the way, than the police took of unarmed black Americans last year. She's not going to mention any of that. She's not going to mention the complete, the, the complete looting of entire districts of New York, L.A., Washington, D.C., Chicago. She's not going to mention any of that stuff because it doesn't exist. Poof. It's just that Trump isn't empathetic. That's the big problem here. Trump lacks in empathy. And it doesn't matter that politicians pushing the lying narrative that America is systemically racist and targeting black people for death in endless numbers. Right? There's a never-ending list of black people targeted for death by the cops. That is significantly more damaging to America, by the way. What she says, that there's a never-ending list of black Americans being targeted by the cops, is significantly more of a lie and more damaging to the United States than Donald Trump not saying the phrase Black Lives Matter because it's semantically overloaded. But she is going to pretend that this is all just an issue of empathy. And this is the game the Democrats love to play. If you disagree with them, it's because you're just not caring enough, guys. It's because you don't care. And watch, I will show you how much I care because I'm gonna blink slowly right now. You ready? One, two, three, go. Caring. Did you see it? Did you see the caring happening right there? That means that I know what's best for America because I have empathy, right? That is, that is the shtick. Okay, and then Michelle's, and then Michelle lectured, lectured all Americans that we lack empathy. I mean, she doesn't lack empathy, but you lack empathy. Here is Michelle Obama again on empathy. Empathy, 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 empathy. Right now, kids in this country are seeing what happens when we stop requiring empathy of one another. They're looking around wondering if we've been lying to them this whole time about who we are and what we truly value. They see people shouting in grocery stores, unwilling to wear a mask to keep us all safe. They see people calling the police on folks minding their own business just because of the color of their skin. Um, if we're going to go with like examples of lack of empathy in the United States, I, I would probably th those can fit the bill. Sure. I mean, people not wearing masks when they should be wearing masks and screaming about it or or people who are or people who are calling the police on people under unjust circumstances, although frankly, I think that that is, is typically less of a statistical problem. But if I were gonna go with like lack of empathy in, in America today, I'd probably go with the people who are literally stopping cars and then beating the living hell out of people because of their race. That seems like that might be a good one. How about like burning down stores? That's a good example of lack of empathy. Notice what doesn't make the speech, of course, because the fact is that not a single Democrat will condemn Antifa, will condemn Black Lives Matter looters and rioters, not a single one, but they are the party of empathy. So much empathy, incredible levels of empathy, in fact. And by the way, Michelle Obama, so much going high here, so much going high in the speech. So for example, like Michelle Obama simply says that without any evidence, we're gonna stop black people from voting if you're the Trump administration, that America is stopping black people from voting. This is her going high, guys. She's not undermining electoral in integrity. Only Trump does that. Here, here she was going high by saying that black people are gonna be stopped from voting. Right now, Folks who know they cannot win fair and square at the ballot box are doing everything they can to stop us from voting. They're closing down polling places in minority neighborhoods. They're purging voter rolls. They're sending people out to intimidate voters, and they're lying about the security of our ballots. These tactics are not new. Okay, and then she goes on to try and compare this to the past of voter suppression in the United States, which is patently crazy. Again, black Americans have voted in larger numbers than the percentage of the population for several election cycles in a row in the United States, actually. Barack Obama was reelected in 2012 almost solely because of that, statistically speaking. And then finally, Michelle gets to her final pitch, which is Trump is in over his head, which I need to hear from a former first lady who has run precisely zero things. Zero. Like, listen, I may agree that Trump has botched a fair number of things, but Michelle Obama's experience with running things is basically relegated to the White House vegetable garden. Hey, if you want to have Barack Obama say this, he's allowed to do it. If you want to have any governor say this, they're allowed to, except for Andrew Cuomo, he's not allowed to say it. But Michelle Obama saying that Trump is in over his head. Again, I don't know what her qualifications are to say this. I understand she's a popular political figure and it's a popular thing to say, but I'm just wondering what she has run so successfully that it, that gives her the credibility to say this sort of thing. Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he is clearly in over his head. He cannot meet this moment. He simply cannot be who we need him to be for us. It is what it is. It is what it is, is of course her suggesting that Trump doesn't care about COVID deaths because he said at one point that when people die, that is what it is that doesn't change. And so a fully dishonest, 
pretty vicious, viciously political partisan speech by Michelle Obama. Effective. She's good at what she does. I mean, I'll say that for her. She's good at what she does. But is she really about politics? Does she hate politics? You get that sense from her. Now, that, that is the next level of the Democratic Party. So whatever happens with Joe Biden, recognize Michelle Obama is on the horizon. And so the Democrats concluded the DNC last night with uh, perhaps the greatest sign yet of their disconnect from many members of the American public. They finished with Billy Porter, who's mostly famous for dressing in women's clothing and going to large events and then getting the plaudits of the media for it. Like he wears like full on glittery dresses to media events because he's an LGBT activist. And I, I don't know what one has to do with the other, but I guess that's like a thing. So he, he likes to wear glittery sequin gowns to major events uh, and women's clothing. And then he receives widespread media praise for this because somehow this is an issue of activism. The Democrats concluded the DNC last night with Billy Porter playing a Buffalo Springfield song in a bizarre cable, like late night cable access, direct access cable take on a 1960s protest song. By the way, this protest song was uh, written originally about the 1966 Sunset Strip Club riots. What were those about? For, for those who don't know any uh, L LA history, they're about a group of teenagers and young people who wanted to stay out past curfew and the neighbors were like, you're making too much noise, so they rioted. And so this has become a, because the 60s were in many ways an incredibly stupid time. Like a couple of good things happened, very good things happened during the 60s, the Civil Rights Act, for example. And then a lot of really stupid crap happened during the 60s, including some pretty bad music. Here was Billy Porter doing his rendition of a Buffalo Springfield song, because this is what, in you want to, like everything they say, this is actually what the Democratic Party is. It's Billy Porter singing Buffalo Springfield from 1966. Children, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down. bunch of uh, slogans popping up behind Black Lives Matter, the, the Black Lives Matter fist, uh, him dancing strangely and wearing like a weird cape. Maybe Donald Trump will be president forever after all, like forever. All righty, guys, we'll be back here later today with two additional hours of content. Also, I'm doing an all access live tonight so we can discuss all of this. Otherwise, we'll see you here tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. <laughs> The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas, executive producer Jeremy Boring, supervising producer Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling, assistant director Pavel Wydowski, technical producer Austin Stevens, playback and media operated by Nick Sheehan, associate producer Katie Swinnerton, edited by Adam Saievitz, audio is mixed by Mike Coromina, hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2020. Hey, everybody, it's Andrew Claven, host of The Andrew Claven Show. You know, some people are depressed because the American Republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon has turned to blood. But on The Andrew Claven Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Claven Show and laugh your way through the apocalypse with me, Andrew Claven. 